<coughs> ah, we are live already. It says live at the. It says live. Uh, cool. Yeah, so we might be live. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Hello, and welcome to Polkadot Conversations, a monthly fireside chat series. My name is Zoe. I am the global head ambassador of events for the Polkadot community and the host of this monthly fireside chat series. If you haven't had um, the opportunity to join some of the earlier um, sessions of this monthly fireside chat series, um, they are all online here on Crowdcast. I've hosted um, several events on basic to advanced topics about Polkadot in general. Um, I have interviewed Joe Petrovsky, for example, on the architecture topic, Polkadot architecture, talked with Bill Boone about um, the governance model of Polkadot, and also there's a chat online about the Polkadot consensus algorithm with Alistair Stewart. So very cool topics. Today we are covering Polkadot ecosystem, and I'm joined by Fabi. Hi, Fabi. Hey, hey. Um, before we're going to start and going into depth in the, into the topic, I would like to promote another really cool event coming up. It's the Polkadot Decoded Conference. Um, it's the biggest Polkadot event of the year and also one of the biggest blockchain events in the industry. So next week, Wednesday and Thursday, May 19th and 20th, um, we have two days of very cool content which is actually powered also by the community. So this year's conference was designed that the speakers as well as the content was selected by community members. Um, so if you haven't had, or if you have not registered yet, please do so. Yeah, there's the link already in the chat. And I look forward to see all of you back online next week for Polkadot Decoded Conference. Just some background information. Today's session is going to be like 30 to 45 minutes long. We have a fireside chat, but I also like to have this actually set up very interactive. So please feel free to, to introduce yourself, everyone that's joining here online into the, in the chat, where you're currently based, uh, maybe what you're also doing in the ecosystem, if you're already part of it. And if you have questions, um, I would love to, into, in, to include them also into our session later on. So you can use the ask a question box here below. And um, after our session in the end, we have like 15 minutes time where I try to select some of the questions. You can also upvote for questions um, that I will then raise to Fabi, our speaker today. So yeah, we have Fabi um, joining today. He is um, vice president of um, uh, technology partnerships at Parity Technologies. Um, so the expert in the topic Polkadot ecosystem, very excited to, to chat about this today. And Fabi, you are also one of the early employees at Parity Technologies, right? You joined around 2017 or which year was yeah, it? Yeah, 2016, 2017. So it's like uh, definitely more than four years, like almost five years now um, wow. when I joined. Very, very different place back then. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, we will hear a bit more about your journey also in a bit. Um, just a bit more about your background. You're currently overseeing the ecosystem, of course, as vice president um, for the development for Polkadot, but also for Kusama Substrate and then its related technologies. Today, we are mainly focusing on the Polkadot ecosystem. But as you guys might know, I mean, everything is connected. Most of the, the projects that joining um, in Polkadot are also already in the Kusama ecosystem. But just to, to set the stage here. Cool. Yeah, I always love to to start and kick off these sessions um, to get to know the speaker a little bit more and specifically to hear about your story, um, how you joined Parity or maybe even how you got into into crypto and the blockchain space, and specifically what your personal what is your personal motivation to build actually the new web, the Web three. Yeah, totally. I mean, uh, as I said, right, I, I joined Parity um, like two thousand six, end of two thousand sixteen, beginning of two thousand seventeen. Um, I, uh, I mean, I've, I've been exposed to crypto prior to that, um, like at university, um, and, and kind of like, you know, pre like through, throughout my university career. So I studied electrical engineering and had a bunch of people who are now in the crypto sphere in one way or another, a lot of people who've, who've dabbled in, in, uh, in Bitcoin, especially back then, there wasn't really, really anything else apart from Bitcoin and Bitcoin forks. Um, but then came, uh, 2016 came out of a, 
corporate automotive uh, gig, um, kind of like went through like the the traditional German engineering uh, steps that you're supposed to go through, and uh, was pretty disillusioned. I was looking for something that's a little bit more interesting. So like my first step in was actually not so much idealistic and more. Um, I want to be somewhere where it's more fast paced, more cutting edge, uh, where there's a lot of smart people right now. And it happened to be, you know, end of 2016 was just a time when Ethereum started to get like the first eyeballs, right? Like people started to to, to build stuff, um, uh, like something like the EEA kind of like with institutional interest um, just got started like after I, I uh, launched into the space full, full time. So it started to look like, hey, I can actually do something here. It's not just mining and trading, but um, I, I can build stuff, right? And uh, there, there could be, you know, there's companies evolving around the stuff that's being built and so on. So like the whole narrative of unstoppable code, uh, I guess, appealed more to me as a, as a career than, uh, you know, holding Bitcoin, trading Bitcoin and, 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 and kind of like Bitcoin as a narrative. Um, <clears throat> but uh, yeah, I guess then through that kind of like got inspired by Web3 Vision and the slowing, uh, slowly growing momentum around that. Um, so uh, first it was a career choice and then it became a mission, uh, not, not so much the other way around. Uh, I think for, for most of the people around me, it was, uh, it was vice versa. Cool. Yeah, that's, that's very exciting to hear, specifically with your, with your background. And uh, I mean, you, you experienced so much change also in, at the company, right, at Parity. Um, so because I mean, a lot of people are just new to, to the space and uh, you're one of the early employees. So exciting to, to get also your experience, you know, how the, how the, um, the company evolved actually. So yeah. since you, yeah, since you are with the company for so long, um, can you, and you have been vice president as I know since, since the beginning, of course your responsibilities have been evolved now and increased maybe a, um, a lot. Can you just shortly explain what your responsibilities are like in, in a, in the, on a daily basis and yeah, your contributions also you do um, then to parity technologies? Yeah, totally. Um, so I think it's easier to understand my responsibilities if you understand generally what parity is up to. Um, so uh, like on a very high level, parity, does really do two things: uh, build, uh, build cool tech, and then make sure that people use that tech, right? So those are kind of like the two two major things uh, we're doing. Obviously, in the build stuff, there's a lot of uh, research and product and, and all of that. And then in the adopt things, there's uh, a lot of like product feedback, um, uh, kind of like tools, ecosystem stuff, marketing stuff, uh, events like we're doing it right now. Um, so in this uh, like adoption bucket, right, since we're not a traditional tech company in the sense that we're selling products, right, but everything we're doing are, if you think about because Polkadot or Kusama or Substrate, they're, they're pretty much all like open source developer tools or developer platforms, um, right? So it's not so much tra all, uh, traditional marketing and traditional sales going on, but it's often what we will call ecosystem development if we talk about adoption. So we want to make sure that people use these open source platforms and tools to build other interesting stuff. Um, and uh, all of the activities that uh, kind of evolve around that is what we call ecosystem development. And this is what I'm ultimately looking after in parity. Um, and uh, you already alluded to that at the intro, right? There is Polkadot as, as a technology stack and an ecosystem. Uh, there's Kusama as a, uh, Kind of like a sister network, right, or a cousin network, I guess what we we'll call it. Uh, there's Substrate as a as a toolbox, but then even for even Substrate itself is in a way its own ecosystem of tools and of components that people are are building and so on. So uh, it's all it's ecosystems all the way down, right? It's it's all kind of ecosystems in 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 one definition or another. So it's a pretty broad set of of things I'm trying to do, um, but specifically. It's around growing the ecosystem. So making sure that more people are using the tech uh, we've built, uh, making sure the existing ecosystem is successful. Um, so uh, it can be in, in any form or shape, uh, right? But uh, ultimately just making sure uh, these people are supported and, and are set up for success. Um, uh, it's 
uh, you know, making sure the right things are being built by the right people, uh, and then making sure those people have everything they need to be successful. Uh, that's not just me doing this, right? Uh, just in parity, it's uh, it's really a, a department, right? It's it's around fifty people or so doing nothing else all day long and thinking about these uh, specific ecosystems and sub ecosystems. Um, and uh, there's obviously a lot of other organizations in the Polkadot ecosystem and um, that are also dealing with ecosystem development. And we can chat a little bit about that when we talk about parachains, but a lot of those are, again, ecosystems uh, in, in itself. In, in itself, yeah. Cool. And I mean, through your daily work at Parity, you also, um, and I guess also Web3 Foundation itself has also maybe an, uh, an ecosystem team, or how is the interaction there from your team with, with Web3 on these topics? Web3 yeah, Foundation. we work. Yeah, we work closely with the Web3 Foundation on 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 many many things uh, when it comes to to Polkadot. Um, uh, certainly, like making sure that the ecosystem is growing and nurturing the ecosystem is one of them. So, a good example here is um, uh, the Web3 Foundation grants program, but it's a lot of the like easy to get non dilutive uh, funding for open source development in the Polkadot ecosystem comes directly from the Web3 Foundation. Um, uh, so that's that's one way, uh, like a very structured way, uh, how the Web3 Foundation uh, supports the ecosystem. And of course, we we um, you know we we work closely with with uh, uh, with the folks at the Web3 Foundation. That being said, though, really uh, what I said just now holds right. There's uh, there's a lot of ecosystem teams now that have their own grants program, for example, right? Yeah. Uh, so uh, I don't know, like. Uh, don't quote me to it. I'm not sure if that's true, but like uh, you know, a, a larger, larger parachain teams like maybe a a an Akala or a Moonbeam or a Plasm or or really many of these, you know, might be handing out grants as well, right, to support the Polkadot ecosystem uh, with maybe their own slightly narrower agenda. But um, all of these things ultimately need to be coordinated in a way that they uh, make some sense. Right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's not just working with the Web3 Foundation, but really working with with an array of, of uh, ecosystem players. Cool. Yeah, uh, so, I mean, the, the title of today's e event is Polkadot Ecosystem, Parachains and Beyond, right? So um, parachains is a very hot topic currently. We all know this, a lot of people are asking when are the slot auctions coming, when are parachains going live? It's also one of the last phases of the Polkadot launch itself. Um, but it's not the only, let's say, component in the ecosystem, right? The Polkadot ecosystem consists of several components or more, let's say, projects that are maybe not a parachain. Can you mm. give us all a bit more of an overview? What else besides of, let's say, Polkadot itself, itself as the relay chain and parachains that can connect to, to Polkadot? Um, what other components do we see in the ecosystem? Yeah, it's... Uh, so any classification I think you can put on is imperfect, right? So it's, uh, and there's so many different ways to, to go about it. I think one useful one that I that I use a lot um, is thinking about um, essentially in three larger categories. And as I said, there's a lot of overlap. And if you look too close, this whole um, mental model falls apart, but it's thinking about uh, chains as in parachains in a Polkadot ecosystem, um, thinking about, uh, let's call it decentralized applications, dApps. Again, by some definition, parachains could also be decentralized applications, but uh, let's let's forget about that for a second. So you have uh, decentralized, decentralized applications that are built on top of these parachains, but it could be that a parachain is a smart contract platform, uh, maybe looks a whole lot like Ethereum one, right? And then uh, someone builds, um, you know, a, I don't know, like a MakerDAO like solution on top of that, right? That's what I would classify them as a dApp. Uh, but it, a dApp here could also be maybe a layer two scaling solution, right? Maybe someone deploys a rollup on top of a smart contract platform, and uh, uh, you know that that all of that we call dApps for now, right? So we have chains, we have dApps on top of that, and then a third category is what I would call infrastructure and tooling. So it's all all these components that are being built around that don't really involve deploying business logic on top of Polkadot at all, right? But they do make it easier to deploy business logic on Polkadot, or they make it faster, or more efficient, or uh, more private, or whatever it is. Right. Um, so uh, if you have like uh, node deployments uh, tools, or wallets, or developer tools, or, or that kind of stuff, uh, 
is all you know all falls into that category. Uh, so that's kind of like a high level way of if you look at all the companies doing stuff in a poker ecosystem, pretty much all of that you can put into uh, one or one or the other category. Cool. I mean, yeah, this breaks it, as you said, it's difficult to define it perfectly, but it breaks it very easily down, actually. So we have three categories, you said, let's say chains, depths, and the topic infrastructure. Um, mm. If we stay in these in these three categories, um, just to get also a feeling of the size and maybe the um, yeah the different categories, how many how much percentage of builders are if you have the numbers or yeah know about it, how many um, how much percentage of builders are in each categories, which is maybe the strongest, or are they all have the same percentage of builders? Yeah, um, so. There's certainly I certainly have some indications of that. The um, I will caveat with it with there's no uh, there's no place to look this up, right? Like how who decides whether you know a piece of code that's somewhere on GitHub is is Polkadot or is is a Polkadot tool or is not a Polkadot tool, right? There's no real way to to categorize things. There are like since we talk to a lot of people in the ecosystem, right? We uh, we always try to have some understanding of this. Um, and there's also some automatic ways of like GitHub tagging and so on, where you can get get, get some notion of it. But I would say like if you take you know these these sort of data sources and 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 look at it, you'll see a relatively even split between chains and infrastructure and tooling projects, right? Um, and then you have uh, DApps as being this category that has been for the longest time really underdeveloped because there hasn't been any chains to build stuff on and now goes through this crazy explosion right and mm -hmm. um we will that explosion will will keep seeing right it's uh this has been a lot of talk about parachains so far and it has been the focus and rightfully so and and uh, you know it will be obviously going through the launch and so on but uh, ultimately where a lot of the application action will be happening will be on this dab layer and uh you know you you can think of it as you know if you have one parachain that is a, like an evm compatible parachain that launches you know that might have a hundred dabs deployed on it right so the the ratio dabs to chains will certainly be um uh, very much in favor of of, of dabs ultimately and we we, we are st uh, starting to see the first uh, indications of that Cool. Yeah, and um, let's stay a little bit on the topic of dApps. Um, what type of dApps are we seeing currently already in the ecosystem? I see, as you just explained, of course, it's a bit difficult to um, to have already a lot of dApps or the percentage is, of course, still a bit lower. But can you give some examples? What type of dApps and yeah, what projects are actually going is, are built currently? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I, I would say, look, the Polkadot ecosystem now is big enough to be a rough mirror of, of what we see generally in the blockchain space, right? So if uh, we have now, you know, somewhere between 300 and 400 companies generally doing stuff in the Polkadot ecosystem. Um, so this is not just on, on dApps, but overall, it, that's big enough to have, you know, statistical relevance if there is a trend coming in. So I think, I guess the latest, like really, strong trend we saw was uh nfts earlier this year uh, I, I guess it's still going um but uh that came like you know within the matter of like three four weeks right from like being a yeah we kind of all know what nfts are to okay this is really a thing now uh if something like that happens in the in the blockchain ecosystem then you'll see it in polka dot right suddenly there's a lot of teams starting to build nft stuff um there's a lot of funding for NFT projects. Uh, there's a lot of innovation then happening there. Um, there's a lot of, uh, in the NFT um, example, institutional interest, right? A lot of big brands that are like, oh, we also want to NFT our uh, franchise or IP ownership or whatever we have. Um, so uh, long story short, right? Generally a, a representation of what you see in, in the in blockchain space is specifically on uh, other, open developer platforms. And I, I guess the one where there's the most action right now is, is Ethereum. Um, I would say that Polkadot is probably slightly less DeFi focused than a lot of other, other ecosystems right now. Like DeFi is um, certainly a big 
big part of what's going on. And I'd say maybe a quarter or so of, of the applications built on Polkadot are DeFi related in some sense. Again, we can have a conversation of what's actually DeFi and what's the category of DeFi and so on, but uh, that would self-identify as DeFi, right? Yeah. Um, so, or like stable coins or DEXs uh, or lending platforms or borrowing or, 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 or something in that direction. Um, that is, uh, like I said, there is, I think also through us taking a very, uh, a very neutral approach to ecosystem uh, building, right? We never went out and said, Polkadot, the best platform to build DeFi applications. Uh, we always mm -hmm. said like, there's a larger Web3 vision here and there's general properties that come with this platform. And it might be really relevant for disruption in the finance space, but also for other, other places, right? And uh, maybe for places we haven't, we as the builders of this platform haven't even thought of yet, right? And it is certainly what happened with Ethereum. Right? No one was talking about uh, DeFi and NFTs uh, in, 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 in 2015. So um, uh, that is the approach we're taking. And if you compare that to uh, you know other ecosystems, maybe take an ecosystem like Solana, right? That is very strongly, a very strong DeFi focus through also what they build on the second layer and so on. Uh, we, we, we try to go a little bit more neutral there. I think through that, you see more var variety in what's being built. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so there's there's a lot of stuff that is um, uh, more, I, I want to say like, you know, more like experimental, innovative kind of, we, no one has done it yet on blockchain, but let's, let's, let's see if it works uh, uh, side than just looking at, Hey, what's on Ethereum? Uh, okay, there's you know there's 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 taxes seem to work on Ethereum. Uh, let's let's also build a bunch of taxes on Polkadot. We have that right, but um, I guess after the six dex, you're like okay, we're, we're probably fine with taxes for now. Um, and then people people kind of like move on to 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 more innovative stuff, and that's um, yeah, that's very much what we're seeing. Okay, cool. Yeah, um, I like what you said that Polkadot didn't take on a specific position, right? Especially as a meta protocol or layer zero, it's now um, described, it's actually important to, to leave it open for everyone. And as you said, also to let people think what makes sense to build on top of it, right? Uh, but then being there to support, uh, we talked earlier about uh, also financial support, maybe to give grants out and uh, yeah, let the ecosystem, let's say, um, um, grow from itself coming up with, yeah. these, with these ideas so but then in if we jump into another category the infrastructure category we just talked about um which is very important for mass adoption right um a lot of usability um, and user interfaces falling into this uh, this category how people can actually interact with chains how can you use it and maybe even do, um, doing this uh, even in a in a very nice way um which is the which is, let's say, a challenge, right, for a technology that's very early on. So from your perspective, what do you see um, is, is needed throughout the next, yeah, let's say years or so, what needs to be focused on to be built in the category of infrastructure to actually um, push the Polkadot ecosystem forward in the long run? Yeah, so, I mean, there's, uh, it's really hard to do that question justice, right? But I'll, I'll, I'll try and I actually think um, one, one really important one you already touched on uh, with talking about user interfaces falling into the category. Certainly what we see right now, what I see in, in Polkadot is um, it is a tech stack build from developers for developers to a large extent, right? And a lot of the ways you can interact with Polkadot today, be that if the governance system or the treasury system, crowd loans, like a lot of these things are the user interface that exists are geared towards uh, the pro Polkadot user, right? Uh, you can do everything with it, but to do the things that most people are doing, uh, you still have to jump through a lot of hoops and you have to, uh, you kind of like the standard interface of Polkadot.js apps is, is really powerful, right? But um, I think it would be great if like, uh, especially like subcategories of that that are used by a lot of people are uh, either more integrated in um, kind of like more uh, you know, entry level wallet uh, kind of stuff, or potentially new products are being built around it. And really, the uh, the tools to do that are all there. Like, it's really not rocket science, right? You just need, um, and you know, people are doing it, but uh, it's, it's certainly something that hasn't landed to the extent that I would like to see it. Um, is if I'm 
you know, if I send my mom a couple of dots and say like, hey, now participate in this governance vote, <laughs> it would still like, she would need to like read through stuff to really get to what 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 needs to be done, right? We're not at a point mm -hmm. where uh, she just gets a push notification on her phone. It's like, hey, Polkadot's voting on this, uh, yes or no, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, you'll, you'll, you'll have to, um, uh, understand the underlying system a little bit better to really do this. And I think there's a lot of potential in that. So if, if there are people out there that are uh, interested in uh, great user experiences and making kind of like abstracting complicated things uh, away uh, into like really uh, easy UIs, um, there's a lot of opportunity in Polkadot. And it's, it's, it's going to be a process over the coming months for, for Polkadot to kind of like go through that and accept uh, that it's not just developers now looking at this project anymore, but uh, it's a lot of people who are, are enthusiasts and who are just generally interested and want to know what's going on and ultimately want to interact with it. So uh, that's my first category. <laughs> um, uh, mm -hmm. uh, there's other kind of like more, more deep tech ones. Um, I guess we don't have to go like uh, too far, but um, there's a lot of stuff that can be done around uh, smart contracts on Polkadot. So um, Polkadot uh, it has accepts multiple ways to 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 develop and deploy on it. Uh, one is you know what we talked about, kind of like the the parachain layer is when you build like a substrate runtime, and the tooling for that is is uh, you know relatively nicely developed. Uh, you can build um, Solidity smart contracts. Obviously, we piggyback on a lot of stuff that has happened in the Ethereum community anyway, so that's relatively well developed. Uh, but then from a base layer uh, substrate polka dot perspective, you can really write smart contracts in anything that that uh, compiles down to Wasm. Uh, but there's a big difference between that's generally technically possible and it's really easy to do, right? And the tooling is there and the documentation is there and the languages are developed and so on. So if people are really into um, you know that that part of the stack. Uh, again, there's lots of opportunity to uh, to get involved, and um, um, yeah, it, it's just very high impact. I think if 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 people come up with good stuff there. Cool. I mean, this was a very, uh, have been already cool, very good um, insights from your perspective. Very good to know, um, and. Uh, just wanted to add to this when you uh, brought up the example with your mom. Um, one <laughs> one tool is actually that helps a lot is the Polkadot Wiki, right? It's a very cool um, site. You can uh, get to it via the Polkadot website. Um, it's a wiki which has a lot of information about um, how to build on Polkadot. If you just want to learn or if you want to maintain also the network, um, check it out there. There's a lot of content that's um, that's des that de describes actually a lot of these questions and uh, topics in detail. So um, now also to cover the third category, the chains, they said we have um, in this category, we have the parachains, parathreads, as well as bridges or bridge, bridge chains, as we call them. Um, and I guess a lot of people yeah, know a lot about parachains, but maybe parathreads is also maybe a topic or a word that's not very clear yet. Um, bridges, yeah, not sure about uh, the audience, uh, how much they know about it, but um, to cover all, all three of them, can you explain um, not exactly what it is, but actually the purpose of all three of these um, uh, of these type of chains. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, exactly. So I think there's like three three big categories: parachains, parathreads, bridges. Um, the parachains and parathreads are pretty much the same thing, right? So like, if you understand what parachains are, um, that. That's awesome, right? Para threads are essentially the same thing with different economics around them. Uh, so uh, I guess to go one step back, right? Like ultimately, Polkadot is a, you know, you call it a layer zero, which is kind of like a term that's being thrown around or like a meta layer or whatever you want to call it for layer one blockchains to um, uh, get interoperability and security. And para chains and para threads are two ways of doing that. Um, uh, whereas in parachains, you obtain a slot by you know, locking some tokens, um, uh, either through your own treasury or through by a crowd loan. And then you have that slot for a certain amount of time and you get um, uh, the system-wide security and interoperability uh, provided through Polkadot. Parathreads uh, are essentially a lot of parachains that, or chains that share a parachain slot, right? And then we call it a parachain threat. Um, 
and uh, they pay for each block inclusion in the relay chain. So every time that chain actually wants to progress, they, they pay a small amount. Uh, so uh, I guess in very you know easy terms, it's kind of the difference between uh, you know Spotify where you pay, pay ten euros a month and then you you listen to as many songs as you want versus uh, maybe something like iTunes where uh, you know every every song you want to buy you pay your uh, you pay your ninety nine cents. Um, so it really just depends on what your use case is. Um, uh, but generally, para threads are uh, somewhat of a, like a gateway truck for um, for 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 Polkadot, right? Um, uh, at a certain point, if you have enough usage on your chain, uh, you probably want to upgrade it to a parachain. Um, and then the third category uh, is rich chains. Uh, that in itself is kind of an umbrella thing. Like there's all kinds of bridges you can build and chains you can bridge and um, uh, you know, it's not something we necessarily invented. Um, although I guess in the Ethereum space, we've, um, I think it's hard to say we pioneered some of these things, uh, but by now there's a lot of, uh, you know, bridging happening back and forth between uh, certain blockchain uh, blockchains and varying degrees of functionality and security and decentralization. Generally, if we think about bridges in Polkadot, um, they, we usually think about externally built blockchain systems. Uh, where we want to have um, interoperability to from the Polkadot uh, system, right? So uh, you can think of what uh, something like Ethereum or Bitcoin, uh, which I guess is, is relatively straightforward, right? You want to have uh, wrapped BTC, for example, right, uh, on, on Polkadot. So you can uh, trade some Bitcoin representation on the Polkadot network back and forth. Um, or have the same with ETH, right? But uh, you can do that all the way to actually having a arbitrary smart uh, uh, message passing between these two chains. So you can actually have cross-chain uh, smart contract calls uh, into Ethereum. Um, the the interesting thing with bridging is you get the interoperability part of Polkadot, uh, but you don't get the security part of Polkadot. So whatever this external system is, it needs to take care of its own uh, of its own security. So ultimately, bridging is something in Polkadot that you only want to do if you if it doesn't if there's no other path forward right so uh, the path of bitcoin becoming a native parachain on Polkadot is not a path forward right this is this is not uh, that's not uh, feasible or it's not realistic uh, so the only thing you can really do is bridge right but now the bitcoin uh, network is so secure right there's maybe not really security uh, concerns here uh, but it comes with cost and with latency and just general friction, right, uh, of, of, of bridging an asset. So if you're building a substrate-based blockchain, bridging it over to Polkadot is really not all that sensible, right? You have some of these things in the in the, in the the ecosystem that you see here and there, but it's really not, uh, long-term, it's not really a, a super sensible option uh, just because it comes with a lot of cost and latency and you uh, you have to take care of your own security, which again comes with, uh, cost of inflation of running your own uh, validator set or, or however else you want to secure your your network. Um, I will say one thing about substrate to substrate bridging, uh, which is um, it's generally possible. So what you can do, for example, is bridge something like Kusama to Polkadot, which uh, uh, we intend to do at some point, which I think would be would be a really cool use case actually of of a substrate to substrate bridge. Cool. Yeah, and you, you touched on Substrate. You talked about it in the beginning a bit, but for everyone that's not very familiar with it, uh, it's the framework. Actually, let's call it a blockchain framework um, uh, to actually easily spin up a blockchain and Polkadot itself uh, was built with Substrate. Um, so, yeah, actually most of the parachains and also parathreads are then mainly built with Substrate. Right. Uh, it doesn't really make sense to build a parachain that's that that doesn't use the the um, the framework substrate itself, or does it? Yeah, I mean it's it's possible, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, at some point, it might also make sense. Currently, it's just so much easier to do it with substrate. Uh, it's it's really yeah. the only way where all this tooling is developed and so on. But uh, yeah. Polkadot doesn't really care. Um, so uh, I think in in uh, you know, at some point in the future, uh, it would be awesome if we have a lot of different substrate-like frameworks that all maybe cater towards uh, different use cases or, or, or audience groups or whatever it is. And uh, there's multiple ways to build build parachains. Currently, substrate is um, 
uh, the, by, by far the easiest way of doing things. Cool. Yeah, and again, also substrate itself is a very uh, cool topic. So I, I recorded also a session with Dan Forbes. He's a developer advocate, um, building a lot with substrate and educating about it. If you like to learn more about substrate and the vision of it, um, you can check out this, this crowdcast as well. So um, let's talk more a little bit more about parachains specifically. So um, as a parachain to be added to Polkadot, it must require a parachain slot, um, which are now coming up, the, the slot auctions, which is also one of the last phase of the Polkadot launch itself. Um, and there are also only 100 parachain slots available. So two questions to this. Um, the first one is, what options are there? for a parachain team to get uh, one of these slots. So how would this actually work? And why is this number actually limited to 100 um, slots? Yeah, uh, I mean, I can start with the second question maybe first. Uh, it, yeah. it, it's, a, um, it, it's simply a scalability uh, limitation uh, through the way Polkadot is architected. Um, uh, there are ways to um, expand that. Right, so we talked about bridge chains, right? They don't fall into these parachain slot. Uh, um, um, they okay. could, but they could share one, right? Same with para mm -hmm. threads, uh, are essentially shared slots. So you can connect more chains uh, via the same amount of uh, of slots. Uh, but there's also a bunch of things we can do via optimizations. Uh, there are plans that I would call loosely now Polkadot version two, right? Uh, although it will be, I think, more of an incremental uh, way to get there, but um uh, of how you can increase these things and ultimately there's also something to say about a uh, layer two in if you call parachains layer one right layer two on polka dot um so uh, a lot of scalability um today on ethereum right comes uh, by by rolling things up uh in one way or another and uh doing either optimistic or ck rollups um uh, you know polka is completely uh complementary to these things right so uh, it's although there's a lot of talk about parachains, right? Ultimately, there there doesn't need to be, uh, you know, five million parachains. Uh, and a lot of you have to have really, you know, a hundred really strong parachains that have a really clear uh, product market fit and, and use and so on. And then a lot of this the the, the stuff around it doesn't need to be in a native parachain. Ultimately, um, yeah. But this is also, I think, a, a Evolvement in in a poker ecosystem that we will see over the years. Uh, wait, that was the first question. Uh, what options? Uh, what op uh, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, yeah. So, what options do you have to get a parachain slot? Um, so, th there is this concept uh, of parachain auctions. Uh, it's essentially a an economic game around the allocation of these limited slots, and the uh, the idea here being whoever is willing uh, to lock up the most dots for a certain for a certain slot uh, will win the slot for a certain amount of time, and then uh, and then you you have a parachain slot. Uh, the interesting part is um, if you add on top of that what we call crowd loans, which is the notion that if you want to deploy a parachain, you doesn't you don't necessarily have to have these dots yourself right but they are they, you can ask the community to uh, um, essentially lock dots for you and um, you can have all kinds of interesting incentivization mechanisms on why you why people would do that for example through incentivizing mm -hmm. them through your native token or whatever else it might be right? um, so uh, there's really interesting crypto economic things uh, that you can do um, there's also uh, teams to play with the options of having an on-chain DAO that essentially um, you know, gets maybe a portion of the transaction fees of your parachain. And then uh, every two years or so out of that bucket, right? Uh, you'll be then in a fully decentralized manner. Uh, the community can again participate in, in, in the auctions. And given that your parachain can directly talk to the relay chain, right, you can do that all in a, in a decentralized manner. So there's really cool stuff we can do once this stuff is rolled out. Um, uh, but yeah, currently it's it's uh, just waiting for parachains essentially. Yeah, cool. Yeah, and specifically the the topic or the way of crowd loans is very interesting. It shows again the the power of the community in the Web three world, right? To actually help these these projects to get deployed, to get online um, by actually and by yeah putting your your tokens towards this project, but then also getting incentivized back. back so um, always 
yeah, fascinating to see the power of the community in our industry. Um, so let's say a, a parachain team, um, yeah, you, you talked about already about the crowd loan, which is one way of support, but does uh, Web3 Foundation or Parity itself um, support teams uh, like to, for these parachain slot auctions on the one side, but also to build um, chains? What type of support is um, provided there from your team? Yeah, so on the on the auctions itself, I mean, this is all fully on chain, permissionless, decentralized, right? With that, we don't have we don't have any. I mean, we built the logic and we came right. We came up with it uh, as as a, as a as a sensible mechanism, but there's there's nothing we uh, we as organizations have to do with it, right? Like you can think of that uh, similar to does the Ethereum Foundation have anything to do uh, if you are triggering a transaction on Ethereum and you put a little bit of gas behind it? Like what has the Ethereum Foundation to do with whether this gets included in a block or not, right? Uh, kind of like uh, similar mechanics, right? We're, um, you know, we, we play a role in making sure these things are designed and built in a way that that makes sense. But uh, uh, once um, once the thing is in full swing, it's uh, there's nothing really that we, um, you know, we're not interfering with it. Um, on the building side, um, again, this is a general theme, right? We play, we 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 try to be as helpful while staying as neutral as humanly possible, right? And that's that's obviously always a bit of a uh, you know striking a balance, in particular when the ecosystem is growing as quickly as it is right now, where it's mm -hmm. it's impossible, right? There's more ecosystem teams than there are employees in Parity, like it's impossible <laughs> for us to uh, to to really help everyone in a dedicated manner. Uh, but there are a lot of things that are actually relatively easy to plug into, and they give a lot of value. Right? Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I can I can go through some of them. One, when it comes to building a parachain, certainly the Substrate Builders program, um, which is a um, I call it like an evergreen accelerator, although that's not completely correct, but uh, a dedicated way to like get some of the um, especially technical help from parity to um, to build a parachain. Um, there are I don't know them all off the top of my head, but there's versions of the Substrate Builders program also off from parachain teams. So if you build a um, an application on Moonbeam, uh, I believe it's called Moon Builders, right? They have a similar program. Uh, if you build an application on Plasm, I believe it's called Plasm Grid. Uh, right, it's very similar uh, schemes for these sub ecosystems that also exist. So it's not always necessarily that the Substrate Builders program is the perfect program for you, but there are programs like the Substrate Builders program, like all all over the ecosystem. Um, Web three foundation grants, we touched on that already a little bit. Uh, kind of a, a pretty straightforward to get non dilutive funding for open source uh, work, especially if there's no real inherent business model. Right, a lot of these open source tools. Uh, they provide a lot of value, but they don't really have any mechanism to capture a percentage of it. Um, so Web3 Foundation Grants Program is a great way to, to get that funded. Um, accelerate and incubator programs, um, we either officially partner or have great relationships with a lot of incubators and accelerators all, all, all over the world. So um, if you're more looking for kind of like the business support of building a, a blockchain company, um, it's, it, that's, that's great to have an eye out for that. We do a lot of substrate courses. Uh, so if you're just a developer um, that you know knows a bit of JavaScript or, or maybe some some some, uh, some uh, uh, Ethereum smart contract development or whatever, but you want to really get into substrate, um, that that's something to to uh, um, uh, to look out for. Hackathons, same thing, right? It's a way to have a structured program to to to, mm -hmm. to start building. Anyways, I could go on and on, right? But there's a lot of stuff out there, depending on which stage you are and what you're trying to do. Uh, you can get help from organizations that are already in the ecosystem. And it could be from Parity, but as I said, it could also be from other, other orgs. Cool. Yeah, that's good to know. A lot of support is um, there. And even in the community side, I mean, I, as an uh, ambassador, um, I get a lot of questions like, what can you build? Because people come, may, sometimes join um, as an ambassador, as a candidate, because they don't have uh, uh, the tech yet, but they are so interested in contributing to the Web3 um, to actually explore the, the ecosystem and see what's going on, what's maybe missing, and then coming up with the technology, right? So um, that's also one way to, to maybe, um, if you're 
if you want to join the Web3 movement, you don't know really yet um, what technology is missing to actually explore by being part of the community and the ecosystem itself. <clears throat> cool. Sure. Um, we have some more questions here and also a lot of questions in the ask a question box. Um, I would maybe yeah skip some of our, um, our prepared question and see what the community is also asking. Um, but we have some more, I would like to cover some more strategic questions also because we talk now, now a bit more about um, yeah, the current state, but going more into into the uh, the future of um, the Polkadot ecosystem, um, and specifically about mass adoption, right? It's a very important topic. We are all building in in the Web three in our um, environment, but there's still another world out there, the so called Web two, right? The current the current internet. So I would like to hear from you actually. What are your plans to bring um, the technologies that are actually built in the ecosystem, as well as Polkadot is, itself, to mass adoption. So how are you connecting the dots actually between Web2 and, and the Web3 world? Is there any um, strategy behind, um, yeah, built up from, from Parity side? Yeah, so I, I mean, there's, there's a couple of things in, with that regard, but like on a very high level, I would say that the thing that was true or is true in Web2 is still true in Web3, right? If you think about, um, I don't know, for example, like the the, the old uh, Y Combinator mantra of like, make something people want, right? Like that was like, how do you make a Web2 company successful, make something that people want? That's the number one thing. That's true for Web3, right? Like if you want mass adoption for your, your dApp, it's not, maybe a few people are gonna use it because it's blockchain, right? But if you actually wanna get mass adoption, the same, the same thing is true, right? You need products or protocols or whatever it is or services that solve people's problems um, in a, you know in a way that is 10x, 100x better than what they've seen before. So uh, people tend to often like try to reinvent uh, things for 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 uh, you know for the blockchain space and think like you know there needs to be all these like crazy different strategies. I think there are other interesting ways, in particular through um, like crypto economic mechanisms and incentivizing people and building decentralized communities and so on and rewarding your users, making them co-owners of what you're building and so on. There's interesting stuff here, right? But the, the general truth is still make something that you want, right? Because otherwise mm. there's all, all this stuff is just uh, for nothing, or at least it's not uh, sustainable. Um, okay, that's kind of like the the high level, right? Uh, but then on uh, kind of like on more concrete things, I think one thing that we see a lot right now is institutional interest in, uh, in, in generally in blockchain, right? But certainly in Polkadot, um, mm -hmm. that comes through financial players that are interested in integrating, uh, right? They're not they're not necessarily going so far as to, um, you know, we're we're now building full on on Polkadot and we're building our own products, right? But they look into the blockchain space and they look into what's being built on Polkadot and think about, oh, we're a financial service provider. That's ultimately financial instruments are being built here. How can we integrate mm -hmm. that into our offering for our clients, right? Uh, I guess like famous examples of that, right? Is like uh, PayPal integrating, you know, letting their users allow to uh, to suddenly trade crypto or Robinhood or, or, or Square. Um, but I, or now I guess Revolut, right? The Neo Bank has just rolled out a full on on a crypto strategy. I think those are the beginnings of what we will see of a big wave of traditional companies um, starting to see that this is so big to ignore, or like too big to ignore, right? And the first way of of dabbling in it is integrating it into what they currently have, right? And I think that's that's something we we very much explore from the Polkadot side of like. Where do we already build something that has great synergies with 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 the old world, and um, how can we get uh, get these people, um, uh, you know, uh, a seat in this journey of of, mm -hmm. of uh, decentralized tech? Cool. And are you then working um, with some strategic partners to on on these topics? Uh, are people reaching out to you to see you as a strategic partner? Maybe it's also the other way around. Um, can you say something to this? Yeah, I, it's um, certainly right. It's it's uh, it goes both ways. I think currently we see much more coming in than we have to like go out. Uh, but that can be uh, that's an art in itself, right? Prioritizing the mm -hmm. right way. Um, 
if you look at teams we're closely working with, I mean, sure there are, there are kind of like the traditional player kind of stuff that that I talked about. Uh, it's it's a little bit harder to talk about that because there's often like agreements and NDAs and so on. But if you look at generally teams that we uh, that we work with more closely in the ecosystem, like looking at the teams, for example, that are in the Substrate Builders program, right, or teams that get grants. Those tend to be teams that went through some form of application process, and uh, we, you know, we we made a decision. Hey, this is uh, cool to support, right? And let's 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 work with them more more closely. Um, again, right, it is this balance of like we want to stay neutral, but we also want to make sure people have the help that they need. So uh, that's it's not so much that we are, um, you know, trying to pick winners or, or anything like that. It's really just we're limited resources, and we want to make sure those are deployed the right way. Um, but yeah, those. Uh, you have to work with partners because there's there's so much stuff that could be built on Polkadot that uh, and there's no way we're experts in uh, you know pharmaceutical supply chains as well as in decentralized finance as well as in mm-hmm. like uh, you know uh, IP rights for 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 music streaming or whatever. So ultimately, we we usually come in as the blockchain expert and then have partners in certain industries that that know what they're doing. Cool. Yeah, okay, then let's have a, a quick outlook maybe on the ecosystem also to hear from you, from your perspective. If you were to predict the ecosystem, I know it's always difficult in, in the blockchain space to predict anything, um, but if you could, um, uh, how um, yeah, how would the ecosystem look like, uh, the Polkadot ecosystem in five to ten years, or how maybe um, would you like to see it from your personal uh, perspective? Yeah, I mean, five to ten years is a long time, right? Uh, I think it's it's uh, like five years ago, um, Polkadot as a term didn't even exist yet, I guess. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, so like it, it, it's hard to say, you know, what what is in five years, um, uh, let alone ten years. But I think there are certain things we will see over the years in in Polkadot. So. One one thing I just alluded to, which I think we'll just see over the next like 24 months or so, is obviously the rollout of parachains and then the establishment of a really solid layer one technology base in in Polkadot uh, through through those deployments. And in conjunction with that, will come a uh, proliferation of layer two applications. Right? A lot of the tech. Um, action in Polkadot will migrate to higher levels um, because they can suddenly uh, use a lot of this plumbing that has been built over the last year or two, not just on the very base layer with the religion, but now also on this layer one. And, uh, you know, the, once you're at the point where uh, you have stable coins and you have DEXs and, uh, you know, you have decentralized entities and you have file storage and you have some means for like private transactions and whatever, then then as an application builder you can go and say oh now i have all these tools in my toolbox now i actually want to build an application that makes use of these right and like it's the idea Mm -hmm. of like like truly cross-chain applications that don't don't necessarily even live on one parachain right but uh, you have one part of your application that um uh you know needs to be fully private and that lives on one parachain and another part of your application that's uh that needs really uh, a fast settlement, right? List on some uh, scalability optimized parachain um, and so on. I think that's that's the vision for decentralized application development in Polkadot. And I don't think that's even that far out. As I said, I think this is something that to some extent we're already seeing, right? But we'll, we'll definitely start seeing in, in, the, in, the, in the first 24 months after parachain launch. Um, another thing I think that we'll see, which is more base layer related is Polkadot is we're very much into on-chain governance and building adaptive systems that can kind of like evolve itself community votes and and, and, and consensus in the community. And um, uh, so, you know, it's not so much that there's the Polkadot white paper and uh, now we've built over over the course of, you know, three years or so, or so we build all of that and then we launch it and then we say, okay, have, have, have fun, everyone. Uh, this is Polkadot now. But uh, given that it is so adaptive, right? It it can uh, it can evolve itself, and um, mm. so even Polkadot, right? Like how does Polkadot, how does the ecosystem around Polkadot look in five to ten years? Another variable in that is like how does Polkadot look in five to ten years? Uh, I don't sure. think anyone can answer that right now, right? And I already mm-hmm. alluded to like Polkadot version two ideas or whatever. I think there's going to be a lot of cool stuff uh, that 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 will come that um, you know will shape how an ecosystem can look around Polkadot that 
we don't even know yet, um, but uh, the system is at least set up to uh, to evolve into that. Cool. Yeah, very, very important point you're making, uh, asking about the ecosystem already, where we still maybe don't know how Polkadot itself is looking like. But that's also the beauty of it, right? The beauty of the ecosystem moving so fast, but also the technology and Polkadot itself is also designed um, that it can be, let's say, developed and um, it's, it can change and adapt also to the, the adapt to the uh, to the needs of the ecosystem and the industry. Cool. Totally. Um, yeah, let's jump into some questions of um, raised by the community. Again, guys, you, if you like, you can upload some questions. And um, yeah, I think it was <laughs> quite obvious with which question is on the top. Um, and yeah, we have to see uh, about about these these topics. But I raised it, and maybe uh, Fabi, you have a specific answer to this. Um, when are the parachain auction, or when will the parachain auction um, start? Yeah, as I have to be, uh, you know, a bit careful to find a, a diplomatic answer here, uh, because obviously I don't want to, uh, you know, f front run anything that that will be officially announced. But I will say this much, right? It, we're very close with parachains, uh, like very, very close. Um, it's if you look at what happened on West End over the last week. So West End is a non-value bearing test net of Polkadot. Uh, all of the stuff that we've been talking about in this session uh, has already happened there, right? There has been parachain auctions and there has been para threads and parachains and they've done cross chain messages and then they've been voted in and, 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 and you know, crowd loans have been tested and, and all of that. So we know it works, right? Uh, the next uh, step in this like phased rollout of parachains will be uh, bringing parachains onto Kusama. So um, Kusama kind of like the, uh, it's not non-value bearing anymore, but it's at least uh, less value bearing than, than Polkadot, right? So having a real world economic testing environment, if you, uh, if you want. And um, here, I would just encourage you to look at what's happening on the Kusama governance side, right? And, and uh, if you're, if you, I think if you look really carefully, you might already see something today, um, uh, but certainly, uh, you know, very soon uh, is these things ultimately need to be enabled in Polkadot, right? So you can, you can see them already in the code base. If you look on GitHub closely enough, like a lot of the parachain functionality now is kind of like in the, in the node software that's being shipped. Um, the next step is getting, getting it through governance. So, uh, you know, you, you can find the first indicators of, of, of parachains uh, on Kusama already in the public domain here and there. Um, but uh, yeah, for, for everything else, uh, as I said, just, just wait for the official announcements, uh, but, but they'll, they'll be here pretty soon. Cool. Thanks uh, for this answer, Fabi. Um, can I please have Polkadot? Yeah, some swag. I guess if you uh, attend Polkadot Decoded next week, uh, maybe there's some cool swag coming for all attendees. Um, I got my shirt because I'm an ambassador for the network and uh, contributing a lot. So um, find your way to contribute to the community, uh, attend events, and uh, sometimes we send out very cool swag. Uh, from Kusama Network as well. So um, just be online with us. I think this this answers your question. Um, okay, interesting. Here from Rob. How are exchanges like Kraken and Coinbase going to deal with parachains? Yeah, it's it, that's a that's a good question. Um, I mean, ultimately, I you know they're going to deal the the way they want to deal with it. Like, hey, there's not there's not uh, there's no influence I have over that. But um, if you look at uh, Kraken um, specifically, if you just go on their Twitter on their, on their kind of like announcements, they've made a series of announcements over the last weeks that they will support uh, crowd loans, right? So that you can actually participate in 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 in, in the set crowd loans via Kraken. Um, uh, so that's that's a known thing. Um, I think uh, ultimately, uh, as I said, exchanges will have their strategies as with with, 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 with with everything they're doing. One interesting thing with parachains is that sort of similar to the ERC-20 token standard. So if you think about what the ERC-20 token standard to, um, to exchanges is, uh, while you can suddenly integrate any token that fulfills the standard very easily, right, in your platform, for example, in your exchange platform, because they're all the same interface, it's all the same stuff you have to run, essentially you just have to run an Ethereum node, right, and you know how to deal with, and that's why uh, for exchanges, uh, from a technical perspective, listing your ERC-20 tokens is quite easy. Uh, Substrate does something similar, 
but on a chain level, right? So because they're all all these parachains are built with substrate, um, you know, a lot of these interfaces look very similar, and a lot of the infrastructure that uh, that, uh, um, uh, for example, exchanges need to deal, deal with look very similar. Um, so uh, I, I think ultimately, as long as there's like a user demand, right, uh, from a technical integration perspective, it's it's um, um, you know it, it's much it, it's it's easier, right, to do this uh, because there's some standardization around the technology that that needs to be used. Okay, cool. Hope this answered your question, also, Rob. Um, let's jump into the next one here from Shiro. Um, uh, regarding yeah parachains again of course do we already know how many projects are applying for parachains on Kusama um, and we talked about already these 100 uh, slots that are available um, how many projects that declare to be a parachain have already secured maybe the KSM so the Kusama token needed for the auction um, if you can talk about some of these numbers yeah so uh, I, you know, I can't say how many have secured their, their tokens or whatever. As I said, like part of that comes through their own treasuries, although I think this will actually be a minor part. I think primarily it will come through the community. And then so it will come down to what does the community think is a useful parachain? And that I, I we will, you know, the market will decide ultimately, right? Or, or the auctions will decide. Uh, so I don't really have data on that, but I do have data or at least some indication on um, you know, how many teams are building parachains and how many, or subset based chains and how many of those are committed to become parachains. And uh, we uh, we do have more than a hundred teams actively building chains that are committed to becoming parachains. Some of them are essentially ready and are just uh, waiting for the uh, uh, switch to be flipped and to be able to deploy. Um, others, you know, might've just got started last month, right? And they are not planning to deploy anyways for the next year, right? So it's not necessarily a problem that there are more than 100 uh, uh, currently. And I think ultimately also what that will just mean if you have more than 100 means better parachains will price out weaker parachains. So uh, that's it's also good to have more, right? Um, and I think ultimately we'll, we'll always see more than 100 going on. Uh, we, we, we do wanna have some competition around these things, but Nothing's decided yet, right? Uh, this auction mechanism, uh, this auction auction mechanism, is the judge uh, on 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 all of these things, and uh, we'll we'll just have to wait for that. Cool. Okay. Thanks, Fabi. Um, you just mentioned uh, an interesting term, saying uh, good power chains or better power chains will be stayed longer. Uh, that's that's of course a bit. Or, yeah, maybe also interesting to know how you define good parachains. I think there's also a lot of content out there, but uh, jumping in, uh, making a transition to, to David's questions here. Um, nice to see you online also, David. Um, how to manage a slot access um, to the relay chain for a long time, right? It maybe connects to what you just said. A good parachain maybe will have a longer um, parachain slot or will be um, maybe revoted um, several times. Uh, what does the project maybe needs to build um, to stay? Can you give some some advice on this to this question? Yeah, I I alluded to that earlier. I think the the strongest um, or like the best mechanism a project can can build to stay on Polkadot sustainably, right, is um, having a crypto economic system that accounts for that. So mm -hmm. if if the idea is that um, you know, you have some crypto economic system in your parachain, however that looks like, you're trying to achieve certain things through that, right? Like maybe one is uh, you don't want your network to be spammed. So you have some economic uh, permissioning around who can, you know, include transactions and they have to pay transaction fee, right? So that's that's one thing you want to achieve. Well, in Polkadot, you'll have, you know, and another thing might be you have a proof of stake system, right? Uh, if you take like, you know, as an example, right, you, you maybe have a proof of stake system, people need to lock tokens to become, play a certain role in the network and to provide security and so on, or validation. Um, and in Polkadot, one, for a lot of these chains, one uh, one goal, right, of the crypto economic system will be uh, to secure a parachain slot in a continuous fashion. Um, and uh, you can do that through through your transaction fees or through the, through the inflation in your system, right? And you can especially do that because you don't need to use your inflation on some of the other things I talked about, like for example, uh, incentivizing a large validator group, right? Because Polkadot already gives you security. 
So mm-hmm. <clears throat> ultimately, it's not too different than what you would otherwise see in 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 um, uh, in blockchain systems. It just requires a little bit of education on how Polkadot works and how the how this how the uh, inclusion of parachains and the security the the system wide security in, in Polkadot works. Um, but as I said, the best way to do it is having it enshrined in the, the the crypto economic system of your of your parachain to start with. Good, cool. Yeah, I think this this was a great answer. Thank you, Fabi, and thanks for the question, also David. And yeah, it's goes through all the other questions. I think we covered um, a lot of the overall topics also on in the chat before. If you joined a little later, this um, conversation will be online on Crowdcast later on. Um, and some of your maybe more technical questions also on, uh, feel free to drop them in the Polkadot water cooler. It's a chat where you have a lot of support also from um, yeah, builders and like core builders from Parity. Um, and you can also join our Discord channels where you can um, drop a lot of your, your specific questions. Um, and again, yeah, all, all the questions regarding SREC and so on, continue to join our, our um, events again next week, the Coder Conference. And uh, sub, uh, Zero is also a very cool conference coming up maybe um, this year where we talk all things substrate um, to yeah stay stay connected with the community. Yeah, I would wrap up the session um, he, now then. Thank you so much, Fabi, for, for all the, um, the content, the insights you gave us to, uh, today. Um, and yeah, for everyone that was joining us today, thank you so much for all your questions. Again, we dropped a lot of links here to stay connected and um, hope to see you online. Thanks again, Fabi. Awesome, thanks for having me, Zoe.